Okay, hi. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, we're a bit late because yeah, having more people coming in, but we uh, will still start nonetheless. So thank you for uh, joining us on a Friday, Sunday afternoon, the day before the long weekend, right? We have about, I think, 90, 100 of you here in this space. So thank you for joining us. My name is Kristen, and I'm part of the company of Good Team. So today uh, is a part of a series of webinars to help uh, our community of corporate givers uh, give um, better. And what we mean by better is um, strategic, impactful, and sustainable. Can I have the next slide, please? So as with all Zoom sessions that you have gone to, uh, there are just three things that I want to let you know. This session is recorded. And if you have questions uh, during this hour-long session, uh, put them in, in the Q&A box and then we will get to them uh, at five o'clock. And if you have comments, want to share your thoughts or react to something, then the chat box is for you. All right. Uh, next one, please. So program quite straightforward. Uh, after I done with my very quick admin thing, Tony will come in, we will do the Q&A and then we will end at 5.30 for the long weekend. Uh, so this is our fourth session on purposeful, purpose-led leadership. Our past topics have included um, like uh, the, the role of responsible business uh, in our pandemic, um, the reality for low-income families. And today we're actually going, I think several levels higher to really look at this topic that we have, have been seeing quite a lot in the media called leadership and how it's evolving very quickly uh, during COVID-19. I think this is an opportunity for all of us to relook really at what sort of leadership is needed uh, and perhaps what really now makes better business sense. Uh, we had a very short huddle with Tong yesterday, and I think both sides feel that people are beginning to, to feel we are in more of a marathon as to a sprint, and people are still in the flux and trying to make sense, make sense of what's going on around them. So today I'm excited to have uh, Tong Yi with us. Um, in his work, uh, he, he wears many hats. And I think today he brings in the different lenses um, to approach this topic. And I'm excited to, to hear a bit more what he has to say about this. So Tong Yi, uh, over to you. Thank you, everybody. Hi. Um, so I want to check in whether my sound's actually okay with everybody. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I'm going to just proceed to share screen. Uh, I need to get co-host, sorry. I just need a sharing rights so I'm able to share. Thank you. So, hi, okay, uh, I'm just going to start today by just setting some very quick context right over the entire thing because I'm quite worried about actually how we're going to land. Uh, I took a quick scan right over the number of people that actually that are coming in and uh, almost actually more importantly the diversity of people that are coming in. Um, in the work that I do over here actually diversity is a very key thing for me and I recognize over here that I like to actually as much as possible um, be able to speak to you guys in a way that actually authentically lands. So I know that uh, within the audience because it's largely an MVPC uh, network right um, you might not actually have ever really experienced me before. Uh, I'll be sharing a quick bio uh, in a while but for now I just like to just quickly uh, <laughs> maybe cap out this or now I tend to speak very plainly and very authentically. Um, so I have no real idea itself right, over whether or not I'm crossing any form of boundaries with you uh, as I begin to actually share some of these particular things. Um, so as I go through these principles and the ideas of what's happening primarily in Singapore and the social sector, um, I think, yeah, please forgive me itself if I in any way cross your boundaries. Uh, so I'll just be aware of that, right, uh, because I do actually speak really quite plainly. Um, the second thing itself I'm a bit concerned about, and I'd like to just to caveat also, is that um, Given the complexity of actually what we are going through in the COVID-19 crisis, 
I very much doubt that many leaders today really have the answers. Um, I do actually hold multiple different leadership positions within Singapore currently. Um, and the privilege of seeing, you know, multiple different councils, committees, girls, whatever the case over here, trying itself right, to battle this crisis. And in truth, um, from most of these places or these vantage points, um, we don't really have an answer. I certainly don't. Um, but what I have over here is an ability to, and we hope that today will be a convening of leaders within maybe the nonprofit sector, the social sector. And in that particular convening, we're hoping to just share the perspectives that maybe can aid each other in making some sense of what on earth is going on right now. So uh, that's really my hope itself, right, of actually how I begin to work with you today. Okay? The last thing, uh, before I move to the next slide over here, is something that I'd like to just share on a personal level. Um, I am generally not doing so well. Over the past, I think maybe three to four months or so, uh, even within the social sector or social enterprise sector, our revenues have dropped up to 90% or so. Uh, and I've been more or less in the past few months over here spending time uh, firefighting. And honestly, if you ask me as an individual, I am uh, more breathless than I've ever been. Um, it has been hard to actually find time to breathe. And uh, even doing this particular talk over here, I think it's uh, causing a bit of a strain. But I recognize over here that as far as the leadership is concerned, there's a need for us to really convene and speak as much as possible and just get a sense of everything that's happening within uh, your work environments, your business environments, and perhaps it's not like uh, this particular country. So uh, please bear with me if at all over here uh, you sense that uh, in the speaking of certain points, I'm expressing more emotion than normal. Um, that could be coming from myself uh, and it may not be an imposition upon you in any way. Okay. So... Uh, a very quick bio. My name is Tong Yi. Uh, I'm the founder and director of uh, one of Singapore's larger groups of social enterprises, uh, primarily called the Thought Collective. So um, we've been operating in Singapore since the year 2000 or so, so we're almost two decades uh, long old. Um, and in this particular work over here, we're primarily working upon, I guess, a very untouched area around uh, social trust and how do we keep trust in society. And early on, I think we um, established the fact that as far as Singapore is concerned, we believe that actually a lot of the success really depends upon the, um, I guess, the strength and the clarity is of um, how we begin to trust one another. So uh, we've been doing this in multiple different forms. Some of you may be familiar with the School of Thought, the Food for Thought, or you may be familiar itself with uh, Think Tank uh, Studios. But in all these particular groups over here, we have established ourselves as what we call the Thought Collective. And largely about maybe four to five years ago, we established another company called The Common Ground. And this is, a, I guess, a capacity builder working with multiple other civil society leaders um, to begin to build up, I guess, uh, their own strengths and their own business sustainability uh, in the work that they do. So uh, I sit on a few different national committees. I think as a result of this particular work, um, I act as an advisor um, in areas of defense, um, family systems, media systems. Um, and in looking at these particular areas over here, I think it's given us the privilege of, a, of both on the ground issues as well as what's happening, I guess, um, in the ivory towers. Lah. And in doing this particular work over here, I think it's uh, given us a very nice middle ground, right, to get a sense of, I see, this is what's going on, and this is what we need to communicate over different parts of the system. So within this given work over here, uh, the way I've structured our time together is by right, we're supposed to have 90 minutes and half an hour of Q&A plus one hour of presentation. And in doing so, I just want to have you say that um, I'm going to leave a lot of the how parts over to the Q&A um, and hopefully itself, like, we have time to get there. And within the Q&A itself, I think if any of you have actually been in, I guess, leadership long enough, uh, you're appreciative, appreciative of the fact that 90 minutes is really too short a time for us to really work into the house. Um, I have very little idea of the context in which you are coming from. So please forgive me if I work on more principles and more data and awareness as opposed to working with your direct concerns. Okay, uh, I'll try my best at doing Q&A, but we'll leave it to them. Uh, for now, I'm going to be largely raising awareness of actually what is going on within Singapore in the social sector and hopefully talk about that positioning of leadership as we did right now. So, um, to set the context over here, MVPC has invited me to come in to speak because largely within the May to July period, I was delivering this particular series of lectures and we were talking about redesigning boundaries, uh, primarily as a result of a post-crisis Singapore. And clearly boundaries were shifting everywhere within the country, right, over what is acceptable, what is not, what is possible, what is not. And this has obviously had huge business disruption as well as societal, political, economic disruptions. 
Um, and in all these political boundaries, as they're beginning to shift, right, we wanted to begin to run a lecture series as much as possible, where I interviewed multiple national leaders, get a sense of what's happening from industry to industry, sector to sector, uh, interest group to interest group, and trying to find some sort of cogency or clarity over what was going on. So this was the, uh, I guess, the inception of why is it MVPC uh, invited me to come in to begin to share this. Um, this unfortunately was a four and a half hours session, and I'm expected to bring this out into one hour. Okay, uh, so I'm going to combine this particular part right, with a follow-up series which we had done uh, later on and it seemed as if as a result of that particular piece, more and more people were asking about how do we stay resilient uh, within all this particular work and people were genuinely burning out as a result of actually how much transition that they had to begin to do and I think different systems were asking then where is the resilience and how do we understand resilience better. So this was a result of another five-hour workshop, right, which we began to put together uh, as, as a resilience piece. The final piece was one in which uh, we had recently worked with Design Singapore um, to look at how do we build sustainable communities uh, and create far more inclusive growth models. And this was a, a result of that if we had an opportunity to reset you know, Singapore or to redesign right, uh, certain things, if we had an opportunity to build from ground up, if some sectors or areas are in... I guess not in such a great state and we want to help rebuild, then how could we begin to rethink that? Right? So these three pieces over here are, I guess, large bodies of work I've been doing over the course of the past four months or so. And what I've been done doing for this presentation is to bring out, I guess, maybe the most uh, clear and most helpful pieces that I believe would help the corporates right, within this particular group. Uh, and in doing so over here, right, then begin to work through, hopefully, into the Q&A. Okay. So that was a bit of a context setting over where, where we're going with this. So without further ado, uh, let me begin. Okay. okay. So let me start with a short story and one that I think will help us understand the, a bit the pieces that we're about to go into. In December 5th, 2018, I was invited into one of the largest, uh, well, I'll say the largest, one of the larger mega churches in the country. And uh, this was almost an emergency call. It was called somewhere itself on a Friday night. And I was asked myself right, to quickly go in and intervene upon a situation of escalating very quickly. Uh, in my own work over here, I do a lot of organizational development work. And we work with systems to help them become healthy. Sometimes over here, we work with institutions, including religious institutions themselves. And in this case over here, I was asked to go in. And the brief was not very clear. It was just that uh, there's a bit of a, a mini crisis going on. So I ran in. Uh, dropped my staff, went in to go take a look. And what had happened over here was that this was an evangelistic meeting that was inviting uh, essentially, I guess, you know, uh, a Christmas service, people coming in itself right, to share the gospel and begin to um, yeah, uh, hear what basically the gospel could, could offer. And what had happened was that uh, two uh, Muslim and Malay women uh, had entered into this particular service and they were wearing a hijab, right? And as they had walked into the service, obviously, uh, the whole congregation itself, right, as well as many other guests who were watching this book, this was very figural and very, uh, well, it was stuck for people. And the two uh, ladies actually had walked all the way to the front and they had uh, sat upon the fifth row. And as they sit there over here, they were wearing their hijab and they began to listen to the whole service. So there was obviously itself, right, uh, a lot of people trying to pretend that, you know, nothing is really going on, it's absolutely fine, you know, this is actually okay. And people itself were more or less like, you know, just trying to get on with, with it. But what happened was that during the end of that particular service, there was an altar call and there was an idea itself of whether or not anybody would like to begin to receive Christ. And these two women actually had stood up and had walked to the front and had asked the pastor to pray for them. Right. At this point in time, what happened was that multiple people within the church congregation were very excited by seeing this. And many had taken out their mobile phones and they began to uh, take an image of a pastor praying over two women uh, who were wearing the hijab. Right. And as he began to pray over here, what happened was that they began to post this particular picture upon Instagram and Facebook. And one particular post uh, said, uh, to the true God be the glory. Right. Um, so what happened over here was that uh, as the pastor began to speak to them, what he had learned over here was that the two women uh, actually were lesbians. And they were actually in love. And they believed that the Christian faith actually was more accepting of homosexuality than Islam. Right. And the reason why they wanted to go in to begin to accept Islam, uh, Christianity was because they, they wanted to stay together as a couple. Right. And at this point in time, what happened over here was that uh, people were posting this on, online. They didn't know the internal context of what was going on. 
Uh, but this is something that alarmed basically the church and was wondering, oh no, you know, what's going on? Now, if you hear this particular story, right, you may get a sense itself of what I mean by uh, the complexity of systems. Because this is not a neat uh, LGBT issue. This is a race uh, issue as well as a religion issue, as well as the issue itself of basically um, privacy, uh, control of information, how things begin to flow. And honestly itself, right, it was a, a, what we would term today itself right, as a very complex situation that doesn't have very clear solutions. And it was largely around 2018 or so that I began to start to notice um, this particular nexus of, of issues. That issues, although itself right, were always present in Singapore, social economic class, social issues, racial issues, they were never conflicted this particular way. And I remember sitting up thinking, oh dear, we have to start taking a look at this because these issues are starting to conflict themselves. So um, the first intervention we had to do was begin to actually find a way by which to take, ask perfectly legitimate members of the congregation to take that post down. And whether or not the church had to struggle with even a right, do I even have the right to do so, right? Uh, because this was largely their own prerogative, but it actually had implications of a national context where Singapore was not ready for something as complex as this, right? If it enters the public realm. So that was the first dilemma. The second dilemma itself right, was one in which we spoke to the, the, the couple. And as we spoke to the couple over here, what had happened was that uh, I had noticed one couple, uh, one, um, yeah, one, one of the women was extremely quiet and the other one itself was very much more outspoken. And when I had spoken to the quieter one, she had said over here, I really don't want to do this. Uh, actually, I never wanted to come to this particular church, but she hates her mother so much. And what had happened over here was basically that the other person had gone into a family feud as a result of actually being in this relationship. And she had purposely come to the church in order to actually receive Christ uh, as a way by which to spite the mother. Okay? And it was interesting over here because this was essentially an interpersonal issue that got escalated possibly into a national level. And if you can see this over here, it's something where, uh, honestly, in the aftermath of this entire situation, obviously because it didn't get into the media, it was one in which we, uh, I was quite relieved that it didn't go out, but it's one in which I still begin to real act today to understand, wow, you know, the, the speed at which this was happening was something which was quite challenging for me, even as a civil society leader. Which brings us actually to this year. Um, Stuff as complex as that itself is currently unfortunately happening all across the country. Um, and part of my own breathlessness is coming actually uh, in that particular vein. We have never, I guess, maybe in our generation over here, and I don't mean to sound hyperbolic or exaggerated in any one given way, but what started off essentially as a health crisis has escalated into an economic crisis, has moved into a political crisis, has then begun to shift into a social crisis, and has also, because of the drama of it, begin to hide ongoing military tensions right, uh, within the world. Right? And uh, this is not even counting the ecological one that we're going through. And in these bigger parts over here, the perfect storm right, of you know, crisis after crisis, all amalgamated and mixed together, I think has caused, at least for the social sector, I'm not so sure about the corporate, um, us to be in a space where there's a very high demand upon leadership to be able to get clarity over what to do and how to figure this out. Right? So I say this from the start, right, that actually I, I don't really bring answers over here. But I bring a result of maybe four to five months of research figuring out what are some clarities that we can all come into. So I'm going to speak about the elephant in the room over here, right, and one in which I'm hoping no one will ask me during Q&A. Um, but I want to talk about basically a, a, um, a legacy issue that's been with us for the longest time. And one itself, I think in the past maybe 10, 15 years, people have been talking about, but I have no real way by which to pivot. Okay? So I'm going to talk about this because um, MVPC, being, MVPC being our host uh, has largely itself by beginning to champion this particular you know, idea of how corporates can begin to reposition themselves. And I can recognize that even though incremental changes are being made, right, uh, this is one in which is systemically, uh, it's, 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 it's a mammoth task, right, to begin to make this particular change because it's essentially it's a systemic change. So let me elaborate very quickly. Um, we know that as far as production is concerned or any government human being, no matter what country we're dealing with, it's that essentially human beings, right, are work together with capital, right? And uh, I think because of the language of this day and age, we have learned that financial capital is a major way in which we can make things happen, okay? 
But we know that multiple other communities, which now don't necessarily have financial capital, are using other forms of capital to actually bring about their own sustainability, their own joy, their own productivity, right, and their own ingenuity. And in doing so over here, you know, New York City, right, may not necessarily be as powerful as Papua New Guinea, may be different itself from Mongolia, but you'll find over here that human beings all across the world use some form of capital by which to produce, right, and by which to create things. And here you have over here what we understand to be eight forms of capital. Um, it's quite a well-researched piece over here around basically uh, what are the types of capital people across the world are using. But within the eight forms of capital, this is the general assumption. So I want to make sure that I don't rush this through too much because we want to resonate right, with what's going up right, in terms of this particular design of what we mean by capital. So we know that fundamentally what we have as far as capital is concerned is all of us have living capital. This is about the minerals, the earth, the ongoing ecosystem, the biosphere itself that we're all a part of. And this is part of our capital. So it's an inheritance in which we have, and hopefully is one in which we need to steward, right? That's the living capital. But we know that the human race has from that living capital generated more minerals, right? To actually make into material capital. This is anything from aluminium to iron ore to, you know, so, so and so forth. And all these things like palm oil are generated itself right, to create the material capital that we therefore use to make commodities and things like that, right? The experiential capital is a result of actually us uh, literally experiencing. So human capital, uh, it only becomes as, as powerful as it is when uh, individual people actually have vast ranges of experiences. The more experiences we have, the more skills we develop, right? The more skilled we become as, as people. And you'll find over here that, um, and I apologize if I put this too bluntly, the social economic classes therefore have a lot of disparity in terms of how is it they experience the world, right? And oftentimes over here, the stereotype is that uh, the lower the social economic class we come from, the less experience we tend to get exposed to. And if we have a high social economic class over here, either through travel or perspective or just simply being part of networks, we are able therefore ourselves like, to gain great experiential capital, right? And from there, we then begin to generate ideas. Right. And we generate powerful concepts, powerful ideas, right? powerful, in some, some sense over here, intellectual property to begin to produce whatever that we're producing there. Okay? And the idea is that from the intellectual capital, we then produce finance, money, you know, so on and so forth. And at least in the Singapore police system, is that as long as we all have money and there's financial abundance among us, we will never fight. And because of the fact itself right, that we all have some level of a strong middle class, we have generally well provided for people, then we can begin to trust one another, right? And build up that particular social capital. So we've often said in Singapore that our financial strategy is our social strategy, right? That uh, providing us to become strongly wealthy as people uh, means that we don't have to share too much part. Everyone gets a piece of the part, right? Uh, from it over here, when communities therefore emerge, there's our cultural capital and beyond that itself as our own aspiration. Now, this is basically a traditional flow. But what you're seeing over here is that the foundation of the pyramid sits upon the use of the living, material, experiential, intellectual, and then financial capital to build up the rest of society. Okay? The challenge over here that we're looking at is that uh, this particular crisis that we're going through has challenged the bottom of the pyramid in this model uh, very tightly. Both the ecological crisis as well as the pandemic, right, as well as basically the ongoing technologies that we have uh, actually hit the bottom of the pyramid quite fast. And what we're seeing is that the social capital on top is starting to crumble. There is, however, another way itself right, of beginning to actually redesign this as far as capital is concerned. Right? And again, I'm slow myself down to actually bring off an idea. And this one, I like or invite you not to bring in too much cynicism into it because it's a narrative in which we are not familiar with, right? but one in which other cultures in the world today have also learned to begin to operate by. So in the same world over here, they begin with the living capital and they begin with the fact that we have inherited um, minerals, trees, and ecological system of biosphere, right? And we have inherited itself this particular natural landscape. And in that living capital over here, people have developed a spiritual relationship together with that particular living capital. The idea that we are inheritors, we are stewards, right? We are grateful for actually what's been given to us. And that spiritual ethos or that whole identity is actually part of the bottom of the pyramid. Right, in response to the living inheritance that we have gotten. Right? From there, there's therefore a way in which people therefore work together, okay? uh, in communion or in work itself right, with our living ecosystem. 
In doing so over here, the trust, the communities that are built, by right, continuing to work together to do that. And the trust is therefore built. Okay? From that particular trust over here, we then begin to allow to have people to create experiences for themselves because we want to begin to develop the human race, right? develop the self, right? for them to be the best possible. Okay? And we know itself like that from the experiential, cultural, social capital that is somehow built. The belief is that is the foundation of actually generating material, financial, and intellectual capital. That because the society is strong and because itself like we come together, then we don't fight over who owns what property of intellectual property. We don't fight over basically material or not material, or who owns this palm oil field or does not. Right? Um, and we find over here itself that the other societies, traditionally considered more primitive, Right, uh, have actually begun to operate this particular way. So what's been happening over here is that we have come a lot into the age where we're starting to look at the idea of whether or not uh, financial capital or you know, companies being profit, motiv profit motivated really itself should be at the center of our mission. Right? Or should the mission over here really be about serving communities, serving people, uh, coming to a space itself right, where we don't damage either ecological or human systems, right? And as a result of that, in that strength, we then begin to build up financial capital. So I've been in social enterprise work right, for the past maybe 10, 15 years, and at least within the, my simplistic understanding, uh, I have experienced this to be a reality within groups of about 100 to 150 people or so. So I've built up organizations itself of 100 plus and recognize this, that this really can be true. Uh, and it can be a felt cultural system. But to imagine this across a country of 6 million people, or much less a country itself of 500 million or 1.4 billion people, uh, I do find itself like that it's caused a huge systemic change. But essentially, when we want to look at the idea of having purpose, right, meaning purpose as strategy, that as long as we begin to focus on each other's well-being, as long as we focus upon basically the, the common good, right, that actually is good for business, um, this, I would say over here, is a huge paradigm shift, right? especially for basically the capitalist world. So I want to name this as the elephant in the room. And I want to say over here right, that um, I'm not here to be moralistic. I think I've been in this particular sector for long enough to know this is not about some sort of moral truth right, to you know, lead corporates and you know, dark, you know, save your souls or redeem yourselves or whatever the case over there. The world is the way it is. Um, but as I see this over here, the COVID-19 crisis has brought out for us very stark, I guess, yellings right, of this particular realities that we're seeing. So let me give you an example of what we mean by this. I apologize. Um, I'm now currently presenting. I know that basically uh, three of you have already asked some questions over there. I'll, I'll be happy to jump into the questions later. Uh, but yeah, um, just bear with me as I go through this presentation. I'll definitely get to your questions as I, as I can. Okay. So what we're seeing over here, right, is that um, this is, uh, I guess, a cultural symptom that's been happening in Singapore for the longest time, right? And the idea is that foreign worker dormitories uh, should not be part of actually my community. Right. And the idea itself of inclusion is not one that's necessarily a part of ourselves because the biggest worry is that if a columbarium or an old folks home or a foreign worker dormitory is actually part of my community, then my property prices will go down. Right? And all data points towards the idea. The biggest fear is really the property price will be affected. So the financial system takes precedence over basically the social system. And that has become a cultural phenomenon in the country. So, um, one, I think a lot of commentary that's been coming out is that the, the spread of the COVID-19 crisis among basically right, the, foreign, uh, the foreign worker right, community with, within Singapore is largely one in which we have uh, maybe as a result of our own financial systems, our own basic you know, boundaries, we just think over here, you should just be in this space right, and just stay away from basically my growing assets. And in doing so over here actually is uh, put a, like a start check right, upon, okay, then this is what it looks like when these kind of things happen. And I think people have been looking at this and going, oh dear, you know, should we begin to change the system? Okay, so I'm going to put this on pause, right, no judgment yet. This is another reality itself that's now currently happening within Singapore. Um, I'm going to ask for some confidentiality within this space. I have some permission to begin to share broadly, but I have uh, not got permission to share the actual hospital. But what I'll be doing over here is sharing a situation that's now currently brewing in one of the larger hospitals in the country, right? And what is going on over here is that 
there has been an unsaid rule that um, the Chinese nurses within this hospital will typically get promoted faster than Indians and Malays. It's an unsaid understanding simply because the amount of foreign talent right, that comes in to serve our hospital systems among nurses, many of them are Chinese nationals. And the reason why they're Chinese nationals is largely because you know, the population itself of the elderly within this hospital actually are also Chinese. So the hope itself is basically that when they hire uh, the Chinese national, there wouldn't be a language barrier and therefore they'll be able to serve these patients better. Right? What has happened, however, itself after this whole COVID-19 crisis, right, is that that was actually an unsaid rule, right? People understood it, right? And if you want to basically uh, be a head nurse and take charge of other nurses, obviously you have to speak their language well, right? And be able to communicate with them well. Um, <coughs> and minorities, although they noticed this, they have not actually really expressed it in any one given way. The trouble is over here in terms of past uh, crisis, many, many foreign uh, um, talent or labor itself that has been working within the Singapore healthcare system have actually been sent home, uh, are no longer able to work in the system, and locals over here actually have needed uh, much, much more. And they have been, I wouldn't say strained yet, but definitely uh, expected itself to do more than they were before, right, because of actually the shortage of manpower and labor. And in doing so over here, it's interesting because many of the foreign uh, uh, talent or workers over here that were working in the system have now since no longer are in the system and suddenly everybody speaks English and suddenly that whole need itself right, of actually uh, or, or that favor of having a Chinese speaker right is no longer as apparent as it was before right and it's interesting uh, but out from nowhere um, people began to or these nurses began to congregate uh, around among racial groups in this particular in this particular hospital and they began to actually talk to senior management and they said uh, we really think you should review our pay yeah, and this is long overdue and we believe over here that if we're going to work so much more harder right now, and we are, right, and now that, you know, there's no more foreign worker talent itself right, that's really helping us, um, we actually demand for more pay. And this is basically almost a systemic issue over here where they have to look at HR policies and things like that since, and they felt since when was race an issue within the healthcare sector, right? Uh, unfortunately, it has become one in this particular hospital and one which is getting a bit more heated um, because the senior management is not used to talking to this, uh, talking about this particular issue or talking about it in racial terms. The senior management was not even aware that there was racial tensions within the hospital system, right? And this existed all culturally. So the uh, larger executive system was not ready for this, but a social, I guess, issue has now permeated into their organizational structure. So, um, some people are already advocating for change. In the case of the foreign worker uh, thing, there are now more and more advocates coming in over here and they're campaigning for this is what we call the Wimby uh, campaign. So you're welcome in my backyard. And this is obviously itself by amongst younger generation that's starting to advocate for this. And what we're concerned about right now is that the Wimby movement among the millennials, among the younger groups over here actually is growing quite strong. And as it's growing quite strong, what is going on over here is that actually uh, resident committees, town councils, right? who voted for a certain political incumbent uh, are pushing back over here and they're saying over here, you know, what are these young people doing, right? Uh, we never said itself, we want this particular change. And the fragmentation across generations is one that we are currently, at least I am currently observing and, and, and watching. And I'm worried itself right, that these ideals of how the system is designed, um, should profits come first or should you know, so social you know, inclusion come first? And this parity, right, is obviously everyone understands that capital is equally all owners are equally. But all capital is important, but all capital is prioritized according to different generations, different gender, different lens, right? Uh, we just have never had a situation where uh, the crisis is bringing up so much more validity and power to what traditionally was a minority voice, right? So when movements like the Black Lives Movement, right, uh, Black Lives Matter movement begins to scale across the rest of the world and enters into a very porous Singapore through our ideas and internet, and, you know, uh, travel and so on and so forth. Um, these particular things over here are starting to actually worry us, right? Singapore traditionally has taken the idea that uh, we are a harmonious country um, and the way we are staying harmonious is actually not to talk about race and religion issues. Uh, this is notorious among schools. We have not actually really addressed these issues, which means that teachers or uh, members of everyday society may not have the skill set by which to handle complex conversations, right? Or even complex tensions uh, among emotions or so. So we don't have the capabilities of this, right? Uh, but we are starting to see this obviously all online. Uh, we have yet to see this enter the public sphere. Um, but I think our concern over here is because this is something that's already sort of opened the can and it's, the worms are starting to come out. 
yeah, and it does matter to Singapore. Uh, and we're seeing these political social changes over here. So at least within the civil society sector, we are really trying our best to begin to build up capabilities for, I guess, far more effective uh, civic dialogue right, within the country. Uh, I know I've been speaking to principals of schools right over the past, oh God, three months or so, right? Uh, speaking to multiple layers of the system, right? And uh, working through how do we train, how do we develop, how do we develop capabilities itself, right? That if this starts to open up in classrooms, um, that teachers feel comfortable in talking about something they've never talked about for 35 years. Yeah. This, unfortunately, let me just pause for a while, drink some water. Can I just get a pause for a while? Um, let me just hear from some of the, on the chat, right? Are you guys doing okay so far? Is there a chat? Oh, there's no chat. <laughs> Ah, uh, okay, cool. Okay, okay. So, okay, yeah? Okay, so I'm just going to proceed. Yeah, thank you. thank you. Okay, so what we're seeing over here, I want you to contrast two main sides, right? Because on the social sector side, right, we are definitely seeing this particular idea of how people are more and more concerned, at least about social issues, and this redesign of a mammoth system, right? How do we basically have, you know, um, social good or basic idea of common good become the priority and the base of the pyramid instead of financial interests? And how do we shift that particular side right there? And in doing so over here, this particular shift, right, in one where I think civil society and citizens of any one given market or, or community are concerned about this. But I'm concerned right now that actually the uh, corporates are not in that same field. They are firefighting like crazy over here because on the same level, uh, actually, yeah, a lot of the business models are deeply compromised. Right? If you take a look at this particular part over here around basically anything from shopping centers to office spaces, right? Um, I mean, I pay a, a considerable amount itself right, for um, my own office space right now and I've not used it for the past four months. So I asked the question, why on earth am I using office for, right? And in doing so over here, I think multiple other organizations are asking the same question. And uh, this, the economists over here, all these people are all running the, the oh, doom, gloom, we're all going to die. Uh, this whole idea of how real estate will compete, the game of real estate is going to change. Yeah, it's going to change. And we recognize that this is far-reaching consequences, right, on how we have designed ourselves. Um, so my concern over here is basically that uh, the corporate sector, which is firefighting right now, is concerned with these particular parts and trying to recover that particular system. But at the same time, the civil society and social systems are trying to actually change that system and says, you know, let the offices die, right? Good riddance to bad rubbish. Um, and I don't know in that complexity, right, whether we're listening in uh, to how the energies are moving. Oh dear, sorry, I that problem again. Give me a sec, I've always had this problem. This is what we mean by bringing ourselves into the complexity right, of 2020. Um, one of my biggest worries over here is that we're not listening to one another. Um, and I'm grateful for platforms like this. Uh, and my assumption is that for a, a certain percentage of you over here, I think more than 50%, you actually really are from corporates. But I also recognize that there are many of, of you which are from the social sector trying to convince corporates to please, you know, yeah, redeem your heart. Um, and in doing this particular work over here, there is that um, ongoing tension where I felt that if we don't have platforms like this to listen to one another, um, we might not be able to really create some level of common good, right, or some way forward. So I know that um, what this crisis has done is given an opportunity for really good conversation. Um, 19 minutes, can't cut it, okay, but I think this is a start, right? And this is the complexity I'm, I'm hopefully able to start to begin to show you. So. Um, I'm going to pause with each slide and just invite you just to read this first. Um, the person I'm quoting from over here is a man called Peter Block. The work that I'm most interested in right now actually is essentially the field of organizational development. Um, 
in summary, is the work of building healthy systems. Right? And I think within social enterprise work and civil society work, um, we begin to realize over here there's nothing more critical than building a healthy system. It's not about the mission, it's not about your business model, it's not about cutting things over there, but the healthy system and the resilience of the system. Because anything worth solving is going to take 10 to 15 years. Right? It takes a long time. And if we don't have an organization that is healthy, that can survive this particular length of time, then generally, I mean, I'm just adding more water into the ocean. And doing so over here, Peter Block, right, has one of the world's most foremost OD practitioners. And he has began to talk a lot right, about this kind of systemic change that's called for at this point in time. Um, some of you are reading his books, right? It's uh, yeah, still wisdom for the years. But what he talks about over here is that um, there is not so much a need for management, but rather a need for leadership. And by this, I'm not referring to your role. So I recognize that some of you are managers, right? I'm not saying self about that. The difference between them, and this just read this. And we've been doing OD change right, for the longest time. And typically what happens is that they want to come in, you know, diagnose the problem, give me some 360 survey, find out what's going on. Okay, let's go uh, create some new policies. Let's begin to like, you know, uh, do some benches, uh, train here, train there, sort of things. But the fundamental ethos or the model about how we begin to operate is something that is not necessarily done. And this kind of work over here in trying to create this, you know, incremental change is great for management work, right? But if we're looking at leadership today, which means a real daring, courageous rethink right, of how things begin to work right now. Um, that requires itself new data, new learning, and the leader is going to move into very uncertain territory. The manager moves into certain territory, which means the manager gets the data, finds the research, does the focus groups, and says, okay, so what can we tweak here to make that particular change? Um, but I think what at least Singapore is going through right now, the rest of the world is going through, is, is there something wrong with the inherent system in which we are operating in? Right? So this is one of the more difficult things I have had to do uh, within the hospital system that I was speaking about. That getting senior management to sit down uh, and learn to begin to form small groups and take the courage to listen to something which they traditionally were not listening to. Um, I, I, I hope I can communicate this well, but it was not easy for them. It wasn't easy to begin to see that uh, this was blind to them on their watch. Yeah, uh, they didn't want to pay attention to it because of how difficult it was to begin to solve. And it was much easier just to give you a pay increment and just solve the issue like that. Um, but being able itself, right, to convene the small group and create a safe enough container so that we could listen to one another right, and get that new data so the leader can stir, the leader can, can remunerate. Right? This is something which was really quite critical for them. So Peter Block is saying that leaders who know how to convene small groups, question to bring learning and learn to release the unspoken this is basically the kind of leader that will understand what needs to be changed, right? In a way, this with the conversation we're having is the convening of a small group. We come together and we talk about difficult issues. We're not laying blame. We're not saying over here that you're responsible, I'm responsible. But we want to authentically listen to the data of what people are saying, right? And creating that safety is a critical skill set in uh, creating adaptive leadership, right? This day and age, yeah. You, you can't adapt if you don't know what you're adapting to. So oftentimes over here, uh, I think the illusion of what I'm referring to is, uh, and I, I want to say this with some authenticity, okay? Actually, we're not really convening. This is actually a one-way platform where I'm speaking to you and the hope over here is that some individual will listen to this and your consciousness will somehow shift. But ultimately, you will go back to your organizations and then you're dead in the water again, right? Change in organizations doesn't happen because some lone ranger goes out and goes and you know, shoots some guns over here and then basically the whole town will somehow corral together and somehow change. Um, the frustration itself of many people who are running within you know, CSR or things like that is that it's a very lonely affair, right? You're probably put over here because either you have <laughs> probably the only one in the company who has a real interest in this and in shifting that particular space over here, if you are really belonging to an organization which has the privilege of actually having an ongoing culture where you don't feel alone, where leadership is behind you and the community is behind you, somehow shift, then that's what makes shift possible, right? 
So a shift in community can benefit from individual consciousness. It can. You can definitely benefit from it because you get insight. But it also requires a shift in the way that groups come together. Right? And we have to find, at least in my side of the world, we're finding ways in which society can convene. We're trying to build more civic spaces. Right? And in that space over here, right, without the energy to begin to move it, right, individual champions don't do shit. Yeah. So no matter how enlightened or woke or where that we are over here, it doesn't really move. So the fear I think that many people are having is, are we going to go back to you know, norm? I don't think we can because the trends are, are quite challenging. Um, but in doing so over here, I think the whole question is whether or not we, I think, yeah, management wants to go back to new norm, uh, go back to the old norm. Yeah. And everyone who's frustrated wants to you know, make some sort of change. Okay. Wow, it's five o'clock already, shit. Okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna try my best over here. There were two very large pieces, one on resilience and one on power that I, I really have not had to, I, I don't know whether I have time to actually go through, I will, I will try, okay? Um, give me 10 more minutes and we will go to some sort of Q&A, uh, but I very much doubt I can go through what I've, I've prepared for you. So I want to make sure that we take whatever that we've been talking about right, and bring it into some clarity or cogency so that we're not walking away with the concepts but we can work together away with a neater models by which to understand this particular stuff or we're seeing how this plays out, okay? So let's go back to square one, okay? Essentially, whether you're a corporate or a government or a civil society organization or a charity or whatever the case, okay? Essentially, you're bringing a group of people together to build a system, okay? And in that system, you're there to meet needs, okay? We in the charity social sector are there to meet needs. Government is there to meet needs, right? Corporations are there to meet needs. Okay, we're all there to meet needs. But in doing so over here, in order for us to get relevance, we have to ask the first question, what do you want? Right? What do I want? What does my customer want? And establishing that intention is really what's critical. Okay? Corporations tend to have a need to establish one to three agendas. Customers want one thing. They buy it from you and then you're done. Okay? Governments are far more difficult to manage because they're not listening to one want, they're listening to 6,000, right? And in doing so over here, depending upon how much more entitled the consumers become, then yes, corporations get more and more complex. But fundamentally, you know, there's one touch point. Whereas in governments, there are multiple touch points. The trouble itself, right, with basically civil society organizations or charities is actually they are also very much more complex touch points. One in which somehow market has failed, government has failed, and we basically pick up the shit. And in doing so over here, right, when we're stepping in to do that work, listening to intentions, they're going, but, you know, beneficiaries often say, but no one's ever really listened to me before, right? So thank you for listening, uh, and I can find therefore a micro solution for them, okay? But you'll find over here that no matter what systems we build, it begins with clarity of intention. That must be established, okay? The second question we have is that once we have clarity of intention, the second question is, okay, then can I get you there? I know you want this right now, okay, but can I get you there, okay? So in doing so over here, that is before a resource question. So I know you want this, but what are the resources you need to get there? So these two fundamental questions, no matter who we are on the ecosystem, are essentially itself are critical, okay? Intention, resource. Now, the challenge of complexity in systems, it really comes from changing the word I into we, okay? Because what do we want and what do I want are completely different issues. So the trouble of what do we want, and if I have 100 people in the organization ask what do we want, you may get 65% of them who will all say, ah, I want similar things. But 35% will all have some diverse, like, weird needs. And what happens within the system is that before we make executive choices, we then say, okay, then I'm sorry, we'll listen to the majority and we're going to go this way. It doesn't mean the 35% is happy. It just means the 65% itself like, gets to decide, okay? And then in, it opens up this tension between diversity, I want to listen to it, but there's some exclusion and inclusion. This is as true for corporations as it is true for societies. Right? And over the time over here, we built up systems where people are continually excluded. And that's where the complexity of systems begins. Right? The second question we have is that, can we get there? And this is the resource question. And in gaining the resource or building the resource, we are always struggling with, so we just you know, lie low, run over here, save our money, do this over here, and then we'll get over this crisis? Or do we take some risk, right? Do some bold innovation right now, right? And make that particular change. So in doing so over here, leaders who are trying to look at resources and building resources are still in this question, right? Risk of stability, yeah. 
And this is a painful question in which they have to start to work through together with them, themselves. Okay, so what has happened over here in the world is that the pandemic, the economic crisis, social inequality, all these little crises, right, are happening at the same time. And as they do, they put a lot of pressure on these two questions. We no longer now know what we want because it seems as if everyone wants something different and we are very uncertain about the level of resources that are coming in. Which is why it plays out upon the Kinefin model. Okay. Those of you who uh, are familiar with this, and thank you for being patient right, uh, in, in going through this over here, uh, it feeds into what we call the Kinefin model. Um, this comes out a lot within organizational development. But what you're essentially seeing over here is an uh, X axis of Axis, which one? Horizontal or vertical? X, Y. Okay, we look at Y axis over here of the agreement. Uh, lower down is we all agree, higher up is we all disagree. Okay, upon the, yeah, horizontal, wherever it is. Okay, on the horizontal over here, the closer we are is that the more certain we are, the further away we are, the more uncertain we are. We don't know where the resources are coming from. And then you will find over here, the further you move up in disagreement and the further you move up for uncertainty, that's a completely chaotic situation, right? So oftentimes over here, leaders or good managers want at best complicated. One of the variables is con control. We may disagree, but I know we are filthy thinking rich, right? Or we are very united, have strong solidarity. We have no money, but we will get there. And either or itself, you will see that when one of the variables is tightened and the other one is wide, we can still manage it because we have one issue to fix. When both start to move up at the same time, right? We move into complexity very quickly and soon, if it's not well led, you then move into chaos. And my worry right now in terms of actual positioning, in terms of the leadership, right? What should they, the data be centered upon is that they need the data on how much diversity there is in the system. They need to be able to see that. And I don't know whether they have the courage to begin to listen to it, okay? The second thing we're looking at over here is this resource, your supply chain, your value chain over here, right? What is being compromised, what is not? Do you really have the resources, right? How do we rebuild right, this particular, I guess, that value chain among stakeholders and so on and so forth? So in doing this particular work, right, unfortunately, I don't think any organization today is within the simple, right? Um, I used to be complicated for some time. Now, past four months have been shit. Um, by doing so over here, that's, that's really my job as a leader, right? To bring some sort of clarity on either one of these variables. So, fake news, multiple realities, um, diversity in society, um, on the horizontal, job displacement, uneven networks, right? ineffective adaptation, but stubborn employees, this all doesn't make it easy. Right? Cynicism, resignation, uh, these habits we have over here where we just feel, oh, you know, they're just talking their own nonsense, why am I going for a town hall? And all that kind of culture, is lowering your resource. You don't have the intangible resource of hope, inspiration, imagination, initiative. These particular parts are all resource. It's not just about money, it's also about culture. And if we can see these particular things, right, these two axes, right, are unfortunately driving this 2020 year, um, a lot of us into the more complex or chaotic environments, as you can see in many other countries around the world. So in order to focus what we're talking about here, we want to see the idea that disagreement and uncertainty is the felt outcome, right? So I don't know about your own organizations. You could be part of organizations right now that still feel very, very stable. Uh, nothing's really changed, right? You've got uh, abundant cash in your, in, your, in, your, in your bank account, right? Everyone loves your leader. Everyone loves the community, right? Then actually, I want to commend you for having done a lot of good work. Because there's no way you are at this stage over here where you have that level of health um, if you did not do your homework and you, have, you, know, you get to live the crisis well. Uh, I want to name, however, many other organizations that are living in disagreement and, and uncertainty. Um, and in doing so over here, I want you to see and not get confused by this, right? That the roots of it is diversity and scarcity. That's the root, right? In between, there can be a lot of drama uh, discussing about you know, safety, provision, is there justice or is there no more trust and whatever the case over there. But these are the issues that are resulting as a result of these um, disruptions. So if we play out, right, questions we want to start asking ourselves over here is what cultures or habits do we need to develop here to handle diversity better and to handle scarcity better? And any of you yourself right, who are leading, you understand this culture is actually what makes the change. Right? 
and what cultures and habits can be developed here to handle these two particular things. And I think this is what makes us a lot more resilient as organizations. I hope I'm not going too fast. Okay. Okay. So, I'll actually just read this slide for a while. So the first question for intention, I actually don't think it's an easy uh, ask. Truly listening to stakeholders and even by culture, being able to create authentic safe spaces where they really give you good data, uh, I don't think it's an easy task in itself. But I think without clarity of intention around our whole value chains and what we're doing, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not so sure basically that we will know how to begin to adapt. The second question itself is whether, yeah, we have the courage to shift systems. Yeah, and change systems and deal with issues that have never been dealt with before. Uh, women and women's identity, for one, is starting to change. Uh, I think some women itself are recognizing that when they're being at home, uh, plus the fact itself, right, that you know now the husband is also at home, um, but he still gets to get away with not helping at home, right? And in doing so over here, the duality of women's roles and demands upon them and expectations of handling the home as well as the workplace. And um, I guess the old patriarchy itself of allowing men itself right, to get away these things over here. And I know that there are many more fathers itself who are changing their particular habits. But that alone itself, right, it's just a question on the family system. Um, how courageous are we to start to design, to redesign ways in which we can begin to work? And this is obviously going to involve resistance, involve some sort of change. And if you can extrapolate this on a family level to an organization level, you can imagine the amount of resistance that will come as a result of courageous change. Um, yeah, but this is something where power will have to be redesigned, you know, stakes will have to be redesigned. But I'm not sure as well, right, we, if we stay the way that we are staying, whether this is, I know these are words that are not so much corporate, but I don't know whether it's good for the world. I don't know whether it's good for our community. I don't know whether it's good for the health of our country. Because some of these issues, they have to be addressed and they don't always go in line with market forces. If there's such a thing as market forces these days. Yeah. So I'm going to bring this itself like, to a bit of a close because I, I do want to open up some time for Q&A. Uh, I will try to send the slides to you, but there's a, a lot of rich slides that, that follow this. Uh, that talk about resilience, right? And why is it we need that particular resilience? And the second thing about uh, power and what's going on with our, our own organizations. But I want to bring this out into the broader world to say that I think we cannot afford to not change, right? So let's give you some big trends that I think are inevitable, but they are there, okay? Uh, COVID-19 numbers. Currently, this is actually a report coming out from May. Uh, the numbers have changed, right? Uh, they've increased. I honestly, if they increase slightly, but not much. Currently, it's up to May. Um, only 2% of all the deaths in Singapore, uh, deaths in the world from the COVID-19 crisis have come from the developing world, okay? Brookings Institute believes that number is completely false. And it cannot be that across the world, only 2% are coming from developing countries. The truth they understand is that largely it's, it's because it's not enough testing or because there's just not enough research and data itself right, to get all these bigger numbers in. And in doing so over here, they believe that the numbers actually are far larger than what we're looking at right now, okay? But the trouble is over here that because of that, um, if you look at, let's talk about Singapore first, like Canada, that they've, their whole economy has heavily depended upon migrant labor, right? Coming in itself from South America, right? And going up to Canada to begin to work. But because they cannot account for the numbers going on in South America, they cannot sort of restart their economy, right? In doing so over here, their systems have depended upon foreign labor. Right. And in doing so over here, it's been very difficult for them to tell, then what, what do we do and how do we bring them back? Right. And even if we open our borders, how do we know itself right, that, you know, that we, we don't have assurance that uh, the pandemic is not going to spread in? So in doing so, even if the vaccine comes out, right, and, we, and we all know this over here, um, that distribution and the length of time it will take to distribute everything, and to even itself right, go to adequate testing across the world, I don't think it will be so soon. Right. So this is something, of course, that has big implications about Singapore and Singapore's model over how is it we have begun to, to work. 
So military and manpower has its yeah, job really set out for them. So if any of you are following this over here, I think you've seen basically yeah, situations about the whole migrant worker situation and so on and so forth. So anything from retail to hospitality, uh, healthcare, uh, everything other than police and, and the military itself are somehow affected itself by this lack of labor right today is coming in. Yeah. Globally, we already know this over here that um, we don't know whether globalization as we know it or the wonderful ways that we traveled before and how we begin to have open porous markets uh, will continue to stay. Um, we know itself that right now because of global supply chains and how they've been affected, uh, even this over-dependency upon one certain country for medicines and pharmaceuticals is something that has scared the EU and scared the US uh, a lot. And I think more of them are looking uh, more introspectively and saying over here, can we begin to produce our own and stop being over-dependent upon other countries? Um, which means over here, this is all bad for Singapore. Uh, being as part of, we have always benefited from globalization, right? Uh, but the state of globalization in the next two or three years, we have no idea. And whether we'll ever return to the state we had before, also we have no idea. Um, this is unfortunately on top of an ecological crisis that is uh, escalating even further. Um, it has yet to hit wealthier countries like Singapore over here, but um, this is from the UN News and I'm hoping that it's not hyperbole. But when they describe this, um, I read the reports again and again, right, and they're not using the words carelessly. Um, there is famine, right, on the size of biblical proportions. Uh, in certain countries over here, because the supply chain has been deeply disrupted and they're not able to actually get the food they can, um, we're looking at basically yeah, tens of millions of people who are going to die from starvation. And um, yeah, the coronavirus is the least of the concerns right now. Uh, unfortunately, because of lack of, I know this is very strange, imports of pesticides and things like that, the locust population has also grown in East Africa. Um, yeah, as you can see at the bottom over here, it's 20 times worse than it was before. And this is all implications itself right, upon food supplies and, and, and food chains. Yeah, so impact upon aviation, retail, oil industry, right? Savings, yeah. these are all big trends. And the reason why I bring this up to you is because of this concern. See, I want to say this as honestly as possible, in crisis, a lot of the times, leaders and managers do not go into deep reflection and thinking about changing the system. In crisis, people go into firefighting and trying to restore the old system. The fear right now itself is leadership actually is not looking at the issues that need to be looked at. And there's a lot of desire itself right, to get things back to normal. I'm not so sure itself, even in the hospitality industry, we will ever get back to actually what we're looking at in terms of normal. There are only so many COVID-19 patients that you can now currently house to keep your business going. Right. And in doing so over here, right, basically, ignorance can keep us emotionally safe. We want to la 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 la. Um, but platforms like this are hoping us to get some conversation going to say, you know, what do we really need to look at right now? Um, because being indifferent right now, it will just make you ill prepared. Yeah. And definitely not have you become resilient. Okay. I'm going to pause here. Uh, the orange slice onwards goes into a whole piece of resilience, right, and what's necessary for us. Okay. I'm going to pause for a while and just check in with maybe Kristen. Um, what's your view of how we take this from this point? Kristen, you there? Yes. I think uh, let's carry on. Really? Instead yeah. of doing questions? Yeah. Okay. Would you, I mean, I, that's, so that's my sense, but I'm happy to hear from the people because I feel that we're getting good with them. And it feels strange to kind of cut off here and not hear the other part, right? Yeah. So maybe but let's, have the, let's, let's just ask folks. Uh, do you want to you want to us to carry on or um, stop for Q and A? Oh yes, I'm right. Okay, Tommy. me. <laughs> Sorry. Really? Yay! School questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I do want to apologize though, guys. Um, I I don't really have enough time to stay back. Uh, to extend to to too, too long. I've got another meeting around like six. Right. Okay. So, okay. Yes, things need to sink in. Am I still okay with the pace? Am I going too fast? You still okay? Okay. Can. Thank you. Okay. So, let's go back to share screen. 
And I really apologize for the four questions from Jimmy, two autonomous anonymous attendees, <laughs> and Hui Fen. I'll, I'll try to get your questions back on email, okay? All right, so let's go back to sharing the screen and go into this piece. Okay, 15 minutes. So uh, the slides are going to change color because actually the next set of slides is coming from a different presentation. This is actually coming from a resilience workshop. This is a five hour resilience workshop. They had to begin to work, right? Because we were working with civil society organizations to look at how do we stay more resilient, okay? So uh, this is actually an effective transition from where we are now uh, ending on the blue and going into the orange. Okay. So can I just have you read this first? So if you could stay with me in getting a sense of this, uh, and I, I, I don't mean to have this slide feel too retarded, okay? But these two words are important. The sense of the goal and the resources that flow into the goal, these two words must be understood, right? What we have right now is a goal ahead of us, but it may be a goal in which many of us as organizations are not prepared to take or not prepared to look at, okay? So the goal in that sense is weak. Even though the challenge might be there, it doesn't mean that leadership wants to look at it, okay? If leadership wants to look at it, then the whole question is, is resource going to flow right into it? And how do we build a resource to make that particular change? So the state of resilience, right, must first consider goal and resource, okay? Second. But it is meaningless to begin to talk about resilience if you do not acknowledge pain. You see, resilience is really about hang in there, bounce back, stay in the game, don't quit, right? It's all these ideas itself right, of somehow staying in that particular game. And the only reason why people don't stay in the game is because of pain. So if there isn't an acknowledgement of pain in the organization, if there isn't a space where we should even have the courage to listen to each other's pain, right, then the resilience conversation is a fake one, right? It won't land. People feel itself is basically pretentious because why on earth, right, should I want to stay in resilience if I'm not hearing each other's pain? So the basis itself, right, of the idea of resilience is that I stay in the game, but it is worth it to stay in despite the pain. But at least I know the price I'm paying, right, to be resilient. So these three terms over here, goal, pain, adversity, resource, are all three areas right, that go into building resilient organizations, right? And you will see over here, and okay, so uh, don't see this slide as an equation, okay? There are just three components, okay, that, that all must be considered when looking at resilience in our own organizations. So what we have in the COVID-19 crisis is unexpected pain, okay? Now, I want to be a bit more personal about this, and again, I apologize if I cross the boundaries, okay? Some of you may have gone through, gone through breast cancer before or have lost a child through miscarriage or gone through an abortion or you might have lost a job or you might have come to a space over here right, where there's a sudden death right, of a loved one. But it could be a sudden tragedy or a crisis itself like that has somehow suddenly begin to hit you. Okay? When the crisis comes sudden and fast, the pain is the first thing we begin to see. Right? And in the pain, the pain will force new goals. Okay? So I have had, I don't mean to be facetious about this, uh, two kidney stones in my life, right? And the first time, uh, the pain was excruciating, right? So kidney stones are described to be similar to childbirth over here. And in doing so over here, it's one of those pains where your lips go white and you're vomiting, like that kind of pain. But the kidney stones over here, at the end of that particular part, I remember just thinking, oh my God, right? And what happened was the doctor gave me the anesthesia and once the pain disappeared, I no longer looked at what could be an emerging goal. The feedback that my body was giving to me is there's something wrong with your system, right? And you need to change your habits, right? Essentially drink more water. But that goal, because the pain was elevated so quickly, right? I did not actually own that goal. So what happened over here was that the pain management, right? Allowed me to not develop new habits. I swear, if those doctors, right? Left that kidney stone in my <laughs> urinary tract, right? On there itself, right? And just left it there for me three or four days, it wouldn't kill me. Okay? But that pain, I swear, it would change my habits. Right? Fortunately, because I'm part of the Singapore system, that pain was taken away in one and a half hours. Right? And in doing so over here, I felt I never needed to change the goals. Until 
my second kidney stone. So what happened over here was that largely almost about seven months later, I had a second kidney stone uh, episode. And this was worse than the first, right? That, that bastard, right? <laughs> Three times the size, right, of the first one. And in doing so over here, wow, I got the message that one because I was in Malaysia at that point in time. And when I was in Malaysia, um, the clinic didn't know what to do, right? Uh, gave me two Panadols and said, hang in there. And they had me sit down there itself, right? You know, one and a half days before they could get some sort of transport back into, you know, into Singapore. Um, yeah, that's the most painful episode of my life, right? And doing so over here, I want to say this not in diminishing your own pain, but to give a metaphor of getting a sense of what we mean by this, okay? In the pain, it will be unexpected and sudden. And this is what we mean itself when we talk about, I mean, uh, in preparing for this, I spoke to many anesthetists and they explained over here that pain is a, is a beautiful system because it's a feedback system. It will only remain as long as the job is not done, right? But once the job is done, pain will go away and says, okay, I've done my job. But the same thing has happened for society. Pain is now currently showing up, right? It's showing up in very strong ways. We're hearing it everywhere. But as long as basically the job is not done, Okay, the pain will keep showing up. Now, obviously, we can anesthetize the shit out of it. Okay. And my greatest fear is that organizations, they anesthetize themselves way too fast. Uh, don't want to see the pain, quickly just find some quick solve and move on and not recognize what could be brewing under. Right? And you know this over here, any of you have gone through a health crisis, it's really about the source. It's not about touching the systems or things like that. If we don't change our eating habits, you know, it, it doesn't really go away. So what we have over here is that part of um, responding to that particular pain is for leadership to own the goal. They need to be able to own the new goal, right? In my case over here was own my drinking habits. Not my alcohol, I just don't drink water. Yeah, but in doing so over here, just adopting or working in itself right, to build up that particular goal. So in doing so over here, you will find that, you know, um, the hospital, for example, that I was working with is, since when was race an issue, right? Yet, if they don't own that particular goal, if they don't own that particular vision of this is actually how we can evolve our system, it doesn't become part of the considerations when they redesign the system, right? So listening to the pain allows us to actually be aware of the new goals, and then it's leadership's choice whether they want to take on those particular goals. Yeah. Personally, I call them cowardly if they don't. I should have said that, sure. Okay, delete, delete. Okay, so <laughs> what happens over here? So it is what we understand that typically only when the goal is established and becomes a clear agenda within the organization, then resource will start showing up. New people will volunteer, new resources come in. We start finding other ways to start right, to monetize or, 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 or create solutions for this. And over time, the pain will diminish, right? Because it has supported itself in doing its job. And this is what we mean by basically systemic change. Um, a, listen to the data, right, around the pain of the system. Two, can we get leadership, middle management to begin to own this particular issue, right? Not to resist it, right, to deflect it, distract it, anesthetize it over here. And if we can, right, what I can trust is that human ingenuity will naturally start searching for the resource to bring in, right? And when it comes in, that pain tends to diminish over time. This COVID-19 crisis is giving us an opportunity to really look at these particular things, right? That's been bugging our you know, cities uh, for decades already. So if I, correct, okay, five minutes. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna fast forward the slides a bit over here, okay? Um, but if I do this, uh, try not to formal too much, okay? But these are all different ways that pain show up and the different dynamics in which we're looking at pain, okay? So one is around the so-called, uh, Sometimes pain is conceptual and people go in with this huge, big vision. Typically, they call them CEOs, right? Big vision, this is what we're gonna do, we're gonna change the world, no, things over there, right? And then they says, don't worry, we're ready, we have the resource, right? And then somebody mutters in the town hall and says over here, yeah, 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 but then this is what gonna happen, but it's a conceptual pain, right? And people are caught up in the vision, they jump in anyway, right? And then after some time, it looks like this, right? So what happens over here is the pain then grows really, really large. 
Uh, and oftentimes over here, when the pain is large enough, the goal starts to diminish. And that's what we call disillusionment, cynicism, so and so forth. This is IR, please. Yeah. Let's just drop the goal because the pain is not worth it. So when leadership itself right, speaks too much on aspirational narrative and does not deal with the pain right, of how difficult it will be to go through, then I guess resource is not enrolled uh, in a fair way. Right? Resource meaning each other's life. Okay, so I'm going to move over here, right? Yeah, but what we're seeing over here is actually there are multiple ways in which these three uh, start to show up, okay? Between goal, pain, resource. Uh, I need the time to self right, to go through each, each of them. But the bottom line is that the more protracted the relationship is, which means that if we have a 10-year transformation vision, 15-year transformation vision, if we're trying to change a whole country, right? These things will definitely show up. And actually, it's a lot of our responsibility as humans or as leaders to begin to pay attention to this stuff. And I don't think we can avoid it because of how much diversity there is in our systems, right? There is no way there will not be an issue of exclusion and inclusion. And right? if you think there isn't, I think you're deluding yourself. Yeah. Uh, diversity shows up in all sorts of different ways. Yeah. And we want to build systems that are healthy for everybody, that we really take care of our staff and take care of our teams. We must pay attention to diversity. Now, so what is the case for resilience, right? Um, this is a piece of work uh, that I had the privilege of witnessing. I, I did not lead it, okay? But I had the privilege of witnessing. This was about three years back. Um, I was in South Africa and we were looking at a, a growing rape epidemic that was happening in the, in the community that we were there to, to, to visit. And the case itself that I was looking at over here was uh, a young man at the age of 27 had gone into a household and had raped uh, three daughters of the household. Uh, they were 12, nine, and six, right? And he had raped all the three children within the household. And in doing so over here, it had shocked the community uh, and they were calling for blood. And they wanted this particular man to hang. Right? What was going on over here, however, was that that particular community uh, wanted to begin to restore safety because they felt even if they hung this man, it would not have restored their lives it would not have brought justice in a way that restores the peace, right? And what happened was that they began to look at the idea of what we call by restorative justice, right? What are the ways that they're being to do this? So the first, if you look at the orange parts of the Venn diagram over there, is that traditional services, right? Traditional ways of doing so is that the victim will have services in counseling them. And second, there'll be crime conversation, which means over here, there'll be some sort of justice done. The man is hung, fined, jailed, something like that, that will happen, right? But that doesn't heal the community. It deals with the symptoms, but not the roots, okay? With the offenders themselves, they will educate them, rehabilitate them, do kind of things over there for the offender. But again, the offender never ever gets to meet the victim, right? So sometimes within the blue circles you're seeing over there, the whole question is whether we can get the, uh, the offender to enter back to the household of the victim for this time again to take a second look at what he had done, right? To contend with basically the offense. And for even the victim's family to I wouldn't say welcome, but allow him into that space to allow him to go into that particular process, right? And also for the victim's family to even look at the offender, right? And be able to say, you know, either I forgive you, or I work, or I'm willing itself, right? To begin to be in that space together with you or just express my anger to you. But all that particular work over here, that victim restitution, the victim offender mediation, even as I describe it to you, you can imagine how difficult that particular work is. And this does not involve the family of the offender and the family of the victims, right? How does basically the mother and father of the offender begin to even meet the mother and father of the three daughters and say over here, this is what my son did to your children. And having the larger community also be part of that process. So I had the privilege about three years ago to witness uh, this particular process. It took this community four and a half years, right? To bring themselves back uh, into some sort of healing. So when I visited it over here, right? I visited almost... Wow, actually no, it's longer than that. Yeah, I think they're still in the process right now. They have cleared basically most of the blue. They have yet to get into the yellow, right? Uh, but they're still committed to doing so. So the community has decided not to hang him, uh, but to really bring the fact that it's not about him. There was a larger community epidemic that was going on. And this is what we call restorative justice, right? It takes a whole different skill set altogether. You can imagine the level of facilitation that's needed. So this is the kind of work right, that we're working through in terms of civil society right now. But what I want you to see is that because healing takes time, right, and restitution takes time, and restoration takes time, resilience must be in play. 
because it allows people to stay in the game. If we want an organizational transformation, it's going to take time, right? But if resilience is not in play, there is no transformation. Because you're transforming halfway through, they get pissed off, 30% leaves, new staff come in, they go, what are we doing through this? And then all this crap, right, that HR has to manage all the time. It's really a question of, but have we built right, the cultural resilience in so that we can work with the ongoing team to bring some sort of transformation in, right? Yeah, and corporates being corporates, I, I empathize with the situation. I think there's so much shifting right, and movement within your organizations there. Okay, which brings us to that closing. So resilience is about building a sustainable, healthy relationship between all three of them, okay? They are symbiotic, which means that they jump upon one another. Each is essential, none can be avoided. But if we want to look at this over here, these are the questions we need to ask in terms of leadership. Okay. What are the new goals? How clear are we, right? And is there strength and buy-in into that goal? Okay. Second, look at the pain. What is the source? Where is it coming from? Explore it among diversity, right? What's the size of this pain? What's the quality of this pain? Is it chronic, right? Is it acute? Right. What is it telling us about what is, you know, is this because of the crisis of COVID-19 or is this something that is your chronic pain in there? We just ignored it. And chronic pains, are, if you can really understand this in your body system, many of us have chronic pains, but we've learned to live with it, tolerate it, right? And we sort of suffer with it. Organizations have the same thing. They have chronic pains, right? They sort of learn to tolerate it. They don't like it, but it can largely change the whole quality of life. Right? And we have opportunity for that. Lastly, where is this resource coming from? Um, how is it being denied, either through you know, power systems or things like that, right? How come some people get information, some people don't get information? How come some people get opportunities, some people don't get opportunities, right? And how do we redesign this over here so that members of our organizations can begin to get that resource? So I believe over here, MVPC invited me in to um, present this opportunity to you guys. We're now living in an unprecedented season, right, of our lives. Okay, and in doing so, we have a real opportunity to make a case for change. But I'm saying over here that corporations have a very big role in looking at societal change. Right? There are things in which as a society, Singapore society and the world, um, needs to be addressed. And if some corporations can even lead the way, right? my belief over here is that you will be seen as leadership. If they can lead the way, right, and you become figural in making that particular change and showing this is what's possible because of what we've done, right, the rest of the world, or the rest of the Singapore can look to you as well for that kind of leadership. And that's why it's an opportunity. It's an immensely powerful branding opportunity. You've seen basically some companies do that, that because of Black Lives Matter, right, they begin to self to just say, okay, then we want to support that, we want to change some of our products, we want to rebrand our products, and go there like in support of that particular work, right? Uh, or change basically to our, our HR practices. But this opportunity is one where I think it's powerful because the whole world is watching, right? And you don't have many opportunities over here where a world is watching at the same time over a similar issue, right? And I think it's a waste like, if we put our heads in the sand um, and try to wish that this thing ended. Um, don't think it will. It's with us at least for the next three or five years or so. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. I think. <laughs> Leftover on slides, I will just... Uh, Ask you things. Okay, thank you. Wow, oh, that was. I was just telling uh Tong yesterday that we, me and my colleague attended the public lecture. <laughs> After the first night, we were like totally zonked out. We were like, man, this is taking quite a bit. I think we, we really need time to let it sink in. Yeah, yeah. So I, I know that there are some questions that are uh on the Q and A. Is, would you, uh, Tommy, would you, yeah, how, how would you want to do this? Justin, I'm actually a bit tight for time today. Uh, yes. I, I maybe take maybe one or two, um, I guess more, more, more urgent questions over here, but I think if uh, just these five, six questions, I'll be happy to answer by email, if it's possible. Yeah. Let, yeah. Okay. Let's, yeah. let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Wait, uh, let me just go through very quickly the questions, just see mm. whether it's possible, okay? Mm. If they're asking me, like, you know, who is God, I, I can't do that. Okay, so... <laughs> um, time, I think. What, uh, for, 
So I think something that's quite easy is the first one about how what, do you have a framework that you use for communicating, uh, I guess, complex or, or, or discussing complex matters? There are, but it can't be done in q and It's, uh, yeah, frameworks take time to understand and to appreciate. Um, but yes, there are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there definitely are. There are, um, I, I noticed the question was actually asked quite, quite early on. Quite mm. early on. Um, the funny thing about this over here is that very complex issues, uh, the methodologies and the frameworks uh, actually have been built in civil society for a long time. Corporates have never needed to deal with this level of complexity of conversation, right? Because enough of commissions and bonuses shut people up, right? <coughs> By doing so over here, I think you're looking at a season where people are not so willing to be shut up anymore. And no amount of bonuses over here right, will get them begin to actually to avoid these issues. Um, mm. So <coughs> I would advise you yourself to look at community building, look at civil society work, look at NGO work. They have powerful frameworks that they begin to use. Um, but yes, they cannot be communicated in even a one-day workshop, please just take some dignity and take some time to learn these skills. Um, Hui Fen, how can we institute fundamental change in a place where people are incentivized to maintain the status quo? Yeah. So, okay. This one I'll try to answer email. Okay. Uh, creating systems with clear intentions. So this one, TOC is... Huh? Is this something you do over email as well? Yeah, probably. Uh, increase the crisis. Yeah, these are bigger questions. Can we? Uh, oh, hi, Leon. Sorry. Yeah, so <laughs> yes. Leon's the one that, that they gave the two anonymous. Thank so, you. So now Thank we you. know who to, yes. uh, yeah, <laughs> to address to. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, uh, question. I'll, I'll be happy to actually take these questions over, over email. I will try. I just want to just ex, uh, express to Valda, uh, Leon, Jimmy, Payfen. Um, if I'm vague in the response, it's largely because it needs actually a longer time or I really don't have a response, which means uh, but I'll be quite authentic in the answer. Um, mm. But if you want to meet for lunch, I'll be happy to make some time just to talk. Yeah. Mm. Okay, cool. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. We have, uh, I, yeah, I think it's a great session. Um, I think that's really food for thought. As what Kathleen said, there's a lot to think about, which is why I think we kind of need the time to let it sink in. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Tongyi, for, for taking your time off and for, for spending a bit more time with us. So thank you. My thank pleasure. You. So we have just last one as the usual with all events. We are having, uh, uh, this is something that's, that uh, has always been with um, MPPC and with Company of Good. We always try to enable corporates to collaborate. And this is something that uh, has come up from us. So if you are keen to look at other corporations or other organizations to work with to create bigger impact, just head on to this website and then there'll be opportunities there where you can look, where other companies are calling for help and say, hey, you know, guys, I need help. I need to find for someone to, um, to uh, do good better. So uh, this is a place where you can look for needs or you can share an idea that you have and you are looking for someone else to collaborate with. All right, so it's coming up good dot sg slash collaborate okay the next one final one i promise so feedback as usual we have been hearing very good feedback from everyone so thank you for um, telling us what you really like uh what you think we can do better and next session it's it's a bit more hands-on so it's uh helping us to design our living programs better so covid has given us this very perfect pit stop right uh we think that things are slowing down uh taking a U-turn. This is a good chance for us to, if to redesign the way we we plan our giving, and to see how we can do giving better. So uh, it's on twenty eighth August. You can sign up again on our website. Okay, and we are good to end the session. Thank you so much, everyone, for staying till 5.40. Thank you, Tong Yi. Uh, have a good, good, uh, long weekend. Happy National Day. And uh, stay safe, everyone. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you.